tonight we are going to be finishing up the prayers of Paul and our mini-series. We started in Romans, and then last week we were in Philippians. Tonight we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. And the thing that we know about the great apostle Paul was that he was a man of prayer. He lived a prayer-filled life. And so before we get into Ephesians tonight, I want to ask this question. Has us studying and talking about prayers, has this enhanced anyone's prayer life? Has this caused anyone to go deeper in prayer in your private time? Anyone? You see, we should put into practice what we're studying. In fact, I want to share with you a quote from a pastor named Matt Chandler, and we uh, studied uh, a series of his in Philippians last year with our men at Sun City called To Live is Christ, To Die is Gain. And in that teaching, he said this. He said, your ability to receive anything new in Christ is inseparably, inseparably tied to putting into practice what you already know. And so I want to encourage you tonight that if you have not been praying, if you have not been seeking God, if you have not been taking these prayers and putting them into practice in your own life, you're selling yourself short. You're denying yourself an opportunity to go from glory to glory to glory in your prayer life. Amen? Let's get into this book of Ephesians tonight. Now, this is, uh, this is arguably the most general letter that Paul has written to the churches. That is, unlike Philippians, which we looked at last week, unlike Galatians or 1st or 2nd Corinthians, or even Romans that we looked at in the first night of our series, in Ephesians, Paul is very generally writing to a very general audience, if you will. Now, if you remember from our study in Acts, Paul spent the most time in Ephesus that he did anywhere on his missionary journeys. In fact, he was in Ephesus about three years. And it's important to note that during those three years, he not only ministered in the city of Ephesus proper, he also evangelized and preached the word of God in the surrounding areas as well. And so when he wrote this letter, he not only had in mind the church of Ephesus in the city proper, but he also had in mind the churches that had been started in the outlying areas. And so for this reason, the book of Ephesus and his prayers are written in a more general way. Now, why does this matter to us tonight? Why are we talking about this tonight? Because it, it suggests that Paul's prayers in this letter to the church in Ephesus, that this letter or these prayers were intended not just for the Ephesians, but for the universal church at large. In other words, for churches everywhere at all times and in every situation and in every season. Now, this isn't to make light of the other prayers that we've seen from Paul in his other letters, but it is to say that wherever there's a church, wherever people of God are gathered, wherever ministry is going on, that these prayers that he wrote to the Ephesians are 100% relevant and 100% on target. And I say that because oftentimes when you bring up things in the Bible, sometimes the argument for people who don't want to believe it will say, well, that was for that time or that was for those people. This is not for us now. No, this is not true. These prayers are just as relevant for us today as they were back then. And so we're going to look at these prayers in Ephesians tonight, and we're going to basically break them down into what I call two flavors, if you will. The first one is prayers that celebrate God. These are what we call doxologies. They call out God's glory. These adore God for something, for who he is and for what he's done. These prayers say, hooray for God, or in more common terms, hallelujah. These prayers celebrate God. And the other prayers that we are going to look at not tonight are prayers that seek God. Prayers that say, God, I need you. I need your help, God. I need you to intervene into my situation. Anyone need God's help tonight? 
anyone feel like celebrating who God is and what he's already done in your life tonight? Amen. I hope that you will take these prayers and put them into practice more and more in your prayer time as we go forward. So given the universal nature of Ephesians, it suggests that the prayer life of God's people, you and I, both corporately and individually, should have a mix of both of these types of prayers. Why is that, Pastor Larry? Well, if we only focus on prayers that celebrate God, we could be drawn into something called triumphalism. Triumphalism says everything, well, actually it pretends that everything's okay, that I'm good, I don't need anything, I don't need God to move at all, and we know that's not true. We all need God to move. Our world needs God to, God's to move. Our society needs God to move. We need God to move. But if we only focus on prayers that seek God, it could lead to pessimism, to, to, to deny all the great things that God has already done. And so we need balance. Someone say balance. We need balance. We need to both celebrate God and we need to seek God as well. So let's get into this tonight. And tonight we're going to briefly look at five prayers that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus or to the Ephesians, if you will. We're going to look at prayers that celebrate our salvation for how complete it is in Christ. We're going to look at prayers that seek the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit now more than ever before. Prayers that seek to see or discern Christ's care for us. Prayers that celebrate God's sovereignty and prayers that seek God's steadfastness. Now remember, these are prayers that we can, we can both together as a church pray or we can pray them in our small group. We can pray them individually over our own lives, over our families. These are prayers that we can use all the time, every day, all day long. So let's get into this tonight. The first one we're going to look at is a prayer that celebrates our salvation. And in this, Paul wants us to understand how complete our salvation is in Christ. And if you remember, Paul was really at odds with the Jews in his day because they believed that not only did you need Jesus, but you needed to keep all the 613 rules and that you needed to get circumcised and you needed to do all these things as well. So he's very familiar with, uh, uh, this is a, a, a touchy subject for him when we talk about prayers that celebrate our salvation and how complete it is in Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. And so Paul begins this letter by basically exploding, if you will, in praise to God. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Praise to God. He explodes and he starts out making it known that he wants to celebrate who God is and what God has done in his life. It's a prayer of celebration. It's a prayer that says, hooray for you, God. Now, his prayer begins with the word blessed or the words blessed be, if you will. Now, what does that mean? So he's not using blessed as a adjective, if you will, to describe God. He is using this as an adjective to desire something about God. He desires that God be blessed. In verse 3, it says, blessed be the God and Father. What does that mean? It means essentially that Paul longs for God, his plans and his purpose to flourish. He longs for God's plans and purposes to flourish in his life and in the earth. In other words, he wants God's will to go forward and be done. He wants the kingdom of God to advance. It's a cheer. It's saying, God, go, God, get them, God, do what you will, God. We're on your team, God. We're not backing down. We're with you all the way. Anyone in the room can say that tonight. God, we're with you all the way. It's important. And in saying that, we're saying, God, we're all in for you. These words, blessed be, that he says towards God, 
are the same as when we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. This is what Paul is saying. God, your kingdom come, your will be done in heaven and on earth. He's saying, go forward, God, have your way in our world, have your way in the earth. Paul's desiring that God be blessed. Why is that? He desires that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, be blessed because he is the one who has blessed us. He says, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. So he opens his letter of prayer or his letter to the Ephesians by celebrating God and wanting God to be blessed. Why? Because God has blessed us. He wants God's will and his plans to flourish because God has caused him to flourish. God causes us to flourish. Anyone flourishing in God? I'm flourishing in the Lord right now. I can honestly say that. I'm flourishing in God right now. And I don't want that to change. I want to go from glory to glory to glory in every area of my life with God. I want him to figure it out and lead the way. I don't want to do it on my own. He says this. He says that through our union with Jesus Christ, he says that we have a few spiritual blessings or a blessing here and there. No, he says that we have every spiritual blessing, every. That is, in Christ, we have everything that we need, the Bible says, for life, righteousness and honor everything we don't need anything else but Jesus give me Jesus when you sing that song and say those words you're saying when you give me Jesus you've given me everything that I need and then where has God blessed us he says where he says he's blessed us in heavenly places and what does that mean it means that he's blessed us in the places of God's supreme authority. God is the supreme authority of heaven. And so what Paul is telling the Ephesians is that when God blesses you in heaven, when he sends down blessings to you in the earth, no one can push them back. No one can deny them. When God blesses you, when he sends them your way, no one can cause them to veer off to another person. No one can cause them to detour from you because God is the supreme authority in heaven. I'll put it to you like this in more common terms. It's as if the president would write a proclamation or an executive order, as they like to say, that says, in 2024, no American will have to pay any tax. And then we woke up. That would be a dream, wouldn't it? But it's the same, why? Because the president is the supreme authority of the White House or of our government, if you will, and what he proclaims cannot be denied. It's the same principle that Paul is getting at here. So when he does that, when God says, I'm blessing you with every spiritual blessing, you may be sitting here thinking, well, pastor, I haven't experienced those blessings yet. They haven't come my way. But because his authority is supreme, you can count on it. You can take it to the bank that the blessings are going to come your way. Just as though if the president said you don't have to pay taxes in 2024, it's not 2024 yet, but you know that that privilege is going to come your way. You can have confidence that God is going to keep his word. So we see in Paul's first prayer that he celebrates our salvation for how complete it is in Christ. The second prayer seeks the Spirit, seeks the Spirit. Why? So that we can communicate with the Father. Let's look at what he says in Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 17. He says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in knowledge of him. So what is Paul constantly praying for for the Ephesians? That they be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
that they have the presence, the approval, the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This is why we as pastors, we emphasize all the time that for everyone to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You need him. I need him. Now, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, oftentimes we associate that with the gifts of the Spirit, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, discerning of spirits, gifts of healing, gifts of faith, all the spiritual gifts that are outlined in Corinthians. And that's important. Paul's not losing sight of that. That's important. Or oftentimes when we talk about the Spirit, we think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all the, fr the fruit of the Spirit, and those are important as well. But that's not what is foremost in Paul's mind when he talks about this. Let's look at verse 17 again. He says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who? Of him, him being God. In other words, Paul wants you and I to have the spirit so that we can know God more. You see, Paul knows this, and I've come to know this about myself, and he knows this about the church as well. That on our own, under our own mindset, our own will, our own thoughts and our desires, we can't know God, we won't want to know God, and we won't do anything to try to know God. It's just human nature. We are so consumed and caught up with our own lives that that's all that we want to know. Paul is telling us, listen, you can't know the Holy Spirit unless, you can't know God, if you will, unless the Holy Spirit reveals him to you. We can't do it. You need him. We need that revelation so that we can pray to him and call on him, speak to him, have him active in our lives. We need that. And so these first two prayers, if you will, the first one celebrates our salvation. The second one encourages us to seek the spirit. The third one is important as well, and Pastor Caden alluded to this. It seeks to see and discerns Christ's incredible care and love for us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 to 19. He writes this. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and width and depth, and to comprehend and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, there's a lot going on in these verses, isn't there? A lot to, to unpack. We won't try to unpack all of that tonight. But the bottom line is this. Paul is praying that the souls of God's people, you and me, that our souls, our hearts would become sanctuaries for Christ. That Christ would want to dwell in our hearts. That our hearts might be open for him in order that we might see this incredible love that he has for us. A very big part of Paul's letter, the book of Ephesians, is this idea that's huge to him. And that's this. That's that everyone needs God's grace. And every kind of person can receive God's grace. Whether they're a Gentile who doesn't know God, who's been worshiping pagan idols, or a super religious Jew who's been following all the rules and the laws of their time that we all need grace. And in that grace, we will come to understand God's love. Let me just share with you real quick the importance of knowing the love of the Father. And this is going to be appropriate for someone in here tonight to take home and pray about and ponder. I grew up in a home where I didn't know my father. I, 
my birth certificate says unknown in the box that says father in it. And so for many years, I went about trying to emulate different people in my family, different men that led me in the military, different people that I knew that were in higher places and I tried to emulate their character because I didn't have anyone in my own house that spoke into my life. And so when I came to Jesus, I came to know Jesus very well as my Lord and as my Savior. When you mentioned Jesus, I was snapped to. You military guys know what I mean. But then I got revelation of him as my father and it changed everything. It changed everything. But I wouldn't have had that revelation without the power of the Holy Spirit coming into my life, having a relationship with him and having him reveal God the Father to me so that I could know that incredible love. Until then, I had no idea what love was. I had no idea about love in a relationship. I had no idea about love of family. I had no idea about any of that. Someone here tonight needs to know God as their father. And then Paul reminds the Ephesians that we all come from the same place. Now this statement, these verses that he says about the father, that the father is one from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, this should dispel any thought or view about Christianity through the lens of racism for every believer. These words that he says, that the Father is one from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Because we can sometimes think that our family, our tribe, our clan, our race is better than someone else's. Paul says that we all came from the same place, that in the grand scheme of things, in the bigger picture, We all have the same last name. Why? Because we're all made in God's image. We all bear the family resemblance of God. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, you look like Jesus. You do. You look like Jesus. Now, the truth is, God's people throughout history have struggled with some type of attitude of superiority thinking that maybe we are better than someone else. The Jews thought they were better than the Gentiles. But Paul says, no, no one is better. There's no place for boasting or pride in the kingdom of God. But getting back to our souls becoming sanctuaries, what does that mean? Paul prays that at the center of who we are, in the sanctuary of our hearts, that Christ would dwell. And what would that look like? that you and I would see this incredible love that Christ has for us. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter the sins that you and I committed before we knew him. He still loves us with the same unfailing love. That's at the heart of evangelism. That is at the heart of everything that we should do as a church, that we want people to know this incredible love of God so that they too can have a relationship with him. So we talked about a prayer that celebrates salvation. We talked about prayer that seeks the truth. We talked about prayer that seeks to discern the Holy Spirit. The fourth prayer celebrates God's sovereignty, how capable he is. Let's look at Ephesians chapter twenty, uh, chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. And this is, a, this is a scripture verse that you hear people say, a lot of times at the end of messages or at the end of services, at the end of events. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So he erupts in praise again in another doxology, if you will, and he's giving God glory for his sovereignty, for his unlimited power, his power that's able to do far more exceedingly abundantly than you and I could ever ask or think. Now, I don't know about you, but I can ask for some stuff. I can think of some things. I've got a pretty vivid imagination. But what Paul is saying here, he's saying, 
Don't let your finite thoughts and your finite imagination limit the power of God in your life. Because God can do more than that thing that you're asking for. He can do more. Now, when you look at Paul, you think, man, this guy was a great apostle. He preached the word. We saw signs and wonders work through him. Maybe he doesn't need any of this power that he's preaching about. That is absolutely the furthest thing from the truth. Paul needs as well. In fact, this brings us to our last prayer. He says, a prayer that seeks steadfastness. Steadfastness in communicating the gospel, in telling our story, in sharing our faith. Our last verse in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20 says this. And he tells the Ephesians Christians, and he's telling us this today, that we should be praying at all times in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And he says this, he says, and pray also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And so Paul seeks the believers to pray for him as well. No matter all that he's accomplished and no matter all that God has done through him, Paul understands that there's times when he's scared. You see, at the moment that he's writing this, Paul is in Ephesus or he may be in Rome and he's chained to a Roman soldier. This is one of the prison epistles chained to a Roman soldier for two years, not knowing the outcome of his fate. So you can bet that he's probably spending some time in fear. But he's scared. Or maybe he's doubting himself. Maybe he's doubting why he let himself get this far that he had to be put in chains. Or maybe he's doubting, man, I've been kicked out of so many cities. I've been stoned for sharing my faith. Maybe it's not a good idea to do that. And maybe some of you here might be thinking the same thing. Man, they're gonna kick me out of work if I tell them I'm a Christian or if I speak to someone or if I pray openly or if I, they see me reading my word, I, I may be cast out. Some of you have even been outcast from your own families because of your faith. I know that. In Sun City, the same thing is going on. So you need these prayers, I need these prayers so that I won't waver in demonstrating Christ to my own family, to my own friends, to, my, uh, to the people in the marketplace that I encounter. We should pray for one another that each of us would own our faith so that we can share our faith with someone who needs the Lord. I'm gonna close with this quote from Pastor Rick Warren who wrote The Purpose Driven Life. He said this, he said, the more you pray, the less you'll panic. The more you worship, the less you worry. You'll feel more patient and less pressured if you pray. You know, it's said that Christianity isn't about what you know, it's about who you know. That goes with a common saying that we have that life isn't about what you know, it's about who you know. This speaks about having connections and about knowing the right people at the right time. And we often say, you know, when someone needs something, they're in trouble, they car break down or whatever, they say, hey, I know a guy. It just kind of comes natural because we are connected people. This idea of having a connection, of knowing someone who can make a difference is at the heart of Christianity. It's why we need everyone and we all need a relationship with Jesus Christ. But I'll take that statement one step further and say this. It's not only about who you know, it's about who knows you. Does he know you? In relationships, both parties have to know each other intimately for the relationship to work, for it to have balance, and for there to be a mutual appreciation of the relationship. Yes, God knew us before he formed us in our mother's womb, but he needs to know your heart. And how does he know your heart? When you're on your knees before him, sharing it with him. And in doing that, you're saying, God, I trust you. I believe in you. I'm giving it all over to you. I'm depending on you. I want you to know me and to know my heart. 
and we share our heart's desires and cares to Him through a lifestyle of continuous heartfelt prayer, this is what it means to pray without ceasing. Let's pray. And speaking about connections tonight, someone is here, maybe you're thinking, you know, I've been going through life and I've been playing that game. I've been relying on connections. I've been relying on this person to connect me to this and that person to connect me to that. And, and I've been going it on my own and, 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 and it hasn't been working out. It's been hit or miss. One day I'm up, one day I'm down. One day the connection works, the next day it doesn't. One day somebody keeps their word and the next day they don't. And I've suffered disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. But tonight Jesus is here is saying, hey, I wanna give you a connection that will never let you down. A connection that never fails. A connection to someone who can do exceedingly abundantly far more than you could ever ask or think. He wants you to have that connection tonight. He doesn't want you to go it alone anymore. If that's you here tonight, and you know that you need that connection, you know that God has been speaking to you, would you raise your hand and just make a a bold move tonight and say, you know what? I need that connection. I see that hand. I see those hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see you back there. Hands are going up all over. Hey, listen, there's no shame in saying I need to be connected. The shame would be to walk out of here and not make the connection when all it is is raising your hand and praying a prayer and making a commitment. That would be the shame. I see your hand. Thank you. But if you raised your hand, I want you to pray something like this. Say, Jesus, I need you. Thank you for what you did for me on the cross. Young man, I see your hand over there. Please forgive my sin of unbelief that separated me from you. I never want to be separated from your connection again. Jesus, I believe you are the son of God that God raised you from the dead, that you're God himself. And now Jesus, come into my life, make a connection with me and be the Lord of my life in every area. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.